salad shooter. This is a great spot. It's kind of dark. Better to see the stars. But you gotta hurry. The same. What are you drawing, sweetie? My new friend. Anyone receiving this? Okay, I think I found a connection. Uh, hey, this is Nashi. Where am I? <laughs> That's a good question. I am lost. Super lost. <sighs> I'm looking for Tamiyo Scroll. With all her memories and stories, tracked it here. Nice, right? I'm gonna get it back. That's all I got left to you. Oh, okay. This way it looks less horrifying. And then the s'more fell right through the Graham counter. <laughs> Did you hear that? I'll go check it out. sure I'm gonna make it out of here so if this is working if anyone's seeing this please send help anyone I'm your host, Blake Rasmussen. I want to welcome you all to the live Duskmorn House of Horror debut at PAX West. So, love to see so many faces in the audience. There's a ton of people watching at home right now, too. We haven't done this in a while, but we are always really excited to be at PAX West because we get to sleep in our own beds. This is our backyard. And so we brought our a game, we brought our a panel. They are gonna throw you unceremoniously from the bright and happy world that was Bloomborough into what you just saw, uh, Duskmorn, House of Horror. So let's bring them on right away. Let's introduce uh, senior game designer, Annie Sardellis, senior art director, Ovidio Cartagena, and executive producer, Mike Turian. Welcome, welcome. Uh, before we introduce them, I also want to call out, uh, you may have received some uh, goodies when you came in. Um, if you can't get enough of spooky houses, and if, like me, you are a fan of Betrayal at House on the Hill, uh, you've got a card in there that you can play in your next haunt. And that art may look a little familiar after this panel. So uh, nice to have all of that under one roof. But let's meet our panelists who are going to talk all about Duskmorn today and hopefully scare the expletive out of you a little bit. Uh, we're going <laughs> we're gonna to start on this side and we'll work our way down. So let's hear from Annie. What was your role on Duskmorn and uh, what do you do? Hi, uh, I led the vision design of Dustmorn, which is sort of early design before we throw it over to set design, which is led by Jules Robbins. Um, I also led our set of four commander decks. Uh, previous to this, I had just worked on Bloomborough's four commander decks, so it was a pretty big, pretty big shift, uh, but still pretty fun. Uh, my name is Ovidio Cartagena. Yeah. Uh, I was a senior art director for Dustmorn House of Horror, so 
responsible for all the visuals and kind of the atmosphere of the set. So if you ask yourself, why so many moths? Why the TV static? I have answers for you. <laughs> uh, hi, Mike Turian. I'm uh, the executive producer for Magic, and I got to work on the uh, and be the lead for Duskmorn as well. Um, as part of that, I get to work on the collectability aspects, the product upcoming. We have some uh, awesome new products with Duskmorn, and I get to work with all of the amazing, talented team uh, as we bring a, a horror set to life. So, super excited to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we are going to start things off by talking about the lore and the world building of Duskmorn because it is an entirely new plane uh, inspired by horror movies, games, and other media of the 1980s with a little bit of a twist to video. Yeah, we, we put the magic lens on this and uh, we're, we're talking about doing this in a mansion. This has to, hap this has to be a haunted house, yes, house, house, house. But what's the twist? What if the house never ends? Great. What if it's a whole plane that is a haunted house? Now that's awesome. Even if you feel you're in a wheat field or you're in a forest or something, you'll see a floating door or a window, curtains, carpet, lamps, chandeliers hanging from the fog above you, letting you know Actually, you're still stuck in the house. You did not escape. There is no escape. And what happened here is this used to be a regular plane with happiness and people in it, but a demon that was locked inside a house took over it. And his way of taking over was growing the house until there was nothing else but him and the house, and you'll feel his presence everywhere. The name of this demon is Valgavoth. Yeah, so you've all met Valgavoth if you have read the story, and if not, I highly recommend going to dailymtg.com uh, and reading that when you get the chance. Uh, Valgavoth is truly something new for magic, and, and for that, we had to give a truly special card, Annie. Yeah. So here he is, Valgavoth, Terror Eater. This is our, you know, big bad of the set. Uh, you know, the bad guys are kind of why we watch horror movies or play horror games. We want to see who's pulling the strings or wielding the axe, right? So we had to go all out making this guy super big and also super hard to interact with. Like, if you even want to touch this guy with a spell, you got to be making a huge sacrifice. So our set team spent a lot of time making this guy pretty bad. Yeah, and, and even though Valgavoth is the house and, and is the big bad, there is more to this world video, including uh, some, some friendly folks, some smiles you may see here and there. Well, Valgavoth did, didn't only grow the house into the rest of the plane. He also affected a lot of creatures and peoples within the plane to his vision. So one of, the, one of the rules for the set was don't have, uh, don't have anything that looks streamlined by evolution. Make it feel designed to call back to like, the uh, practical effects of the 80s. We wanted stuff to feel original and creative. But what's happening inside the house is in the story, uh, Nashi goes missing. And he sends out, much like in the video we saw earlier, he sends a garbled mes message to his friends to come pick him up. You know, mom, pick me up. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> no, no small feat in Duskmorn. I hope you've noticed the Tamiyo screaming at him, trying to warn him in the painting. Uh, and he calls his friends from other planes. Yep, we'll see on Here we see them. It's Tyvar Kel, Kaito, Zimon, Nico, and the Wanderer. And we were thinking, this is kind of like a gang that you would see in any horror movie. There's a bunch of people who come together, and uh, I hope they don't split up. <laughs> <laughs> they, each of them matches a trope in horror. All right, so why don't, we'll go character by character and, and meet the gang, as it were. Um, we've met uh, this card before, but uh, video, tell us about the Wanderer's role. The Wanderer is the final girl, so she's definitely 
out to kill some monsters, not very intimidated by what she sees, makes short work of them. And then we have uh, Kaito, who is the grizzled warrior here. Yep. And we do, Kaito is the one planeswalker in the set, Annie. So why don't you introduce us to his card? Yeah. So when it comes to Kaito, we really want to make sure we're expressing what it means to be like a ninja planeswalker, right? So we've had a couple Kaitos before, but as Blake said, just with one planeswalker, we had a lot more bandwidth to kind of get a little crazy with it. And we haven't used ninjutsu yet on a planeswalker. So here we go. Your first planeswalker with ninjutsu. Uh, yeah, he's all about, all about those ninjas. And he will be slashing fools at your table, so. <laughs> uh, Mike, why don't you tell us about our next character, a, a fan favorite, Tyvar. Yeah, yeah, super excited Tyvar is back. Uh, and, and as a video is saying, for each one of these characters, we wanted them to fit into the, the horror tropes. And of course, the jock is a, a classic horror, right? And um, so Tyvar there, uh, you know, you, you see him carrying uh, the, the bat. And it's pretty awesome because not only is Tyvar a card in the set, but we actually turned the, the bat itself into an equipment. And I know we've also shown off like a chainsaw. And so it's just one of the ways we really tried to bring that modern horror trope to life through those, uh, the equipment that you see when you're watching uh, a horror movie also. Yeah, and Mike, Tyvar discovers the power of math thanks to our next character. Uh, you can tell who's read the story. Um. Uh, yeah, um, so this is Zimone, and Zimone, um, of course, represents my favorite trope, the nerd. Uh, and w with Zimone, uh, she, she was... Uh, in Strixhaven, and there she represented Quandrix. And so we knew we wanted to uh, bring her back uh, uh, to Duskmorn, and you know, she's representing blue and green again. And as we look at her card, you'll really see for fans of math, the design leaned into that piece as well. All right, and let's see Zimone's card. Annie, tell us about... Oh, well, since you're the nerd, Turian, why don't you take this one? Okay, <laughs> this sure. is beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, he, he, here's Zimone, and as you can see there, um, she rewards you for having uh, a prime number of lands on any turn where a land entered the battlefield, right? And so uh, in playtesting, you know, one of the things that I, that I love in Magic is just you find cool combos on your own. And so for me, before we saw the art of Terramorphic Expanse, that's in the set. But when you use Terramorphic Expanse, you can not find a basic land. And so I think in playtesting, I think I played my sixth land as Terramorphic Expanse, and then I sacked it because I'd way rather have another 5-5 five five than, uh, than, you know, yeah. getting a basic land. Yeah. And I think that actually was the end of the game. I think uh, Aaron Forsyth <laughs> conceded right then, because en enough is enough. <laughs> Anything that can make Aaron Forsyth quit. Uh, <laughs> A video, why don't you tell us about the return of Nico, who we have not seen in a while. Well, Nico coming back here is uh, exciting. Nico, they are the leader of the party, the most courageous of them, the one who gives them hope. One small tidbit about this is that little shard showing some sunlight inside of it is the only sunlight in the whole set, in all the art. I wanted this to have the only sunlight because Nico's the one who's like, "Hey guys, let's keep going. Let's 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 uh, let's keep fighting, keeping everyone inspired, leading everyone on." Yeah. And the last of our group is a new character, Winter. Yeah, so Winter is like the goth or burnout of the group. He's also uh, lived the longest in Dustmorn, and I think you can kind of tell. I mean, I'm sorry, just look at him, but still. <laughs> Let's see oh, yeah, his, his card. card, yeah. Okay, so his card is pretty interesting and really speaks to his duplicitousness as a character. Uh, as you can see, he's gonna be giving out cards to a bunch of people. What's with that? I don't wanna give out cards, but his delirium ability kind of cracks down on their maximum hand size, so you'll be profiting while everyone else is like, you know, can't even hold cards anymore. <laughs> So these are the characters that we follow in the story. Again, if you have not read the story yet, please head to dailymtg.com. Uh, then you will laugh at the power of math joke I just made. Um, <laughs> and after this, we do have another story going up that's kind of this guided fiction experience. Uh, so knock, knock, head to this URL when you get 
out of here. Uh, I'll also note that uh, Sean McGuire is going to be here at PAX in room 214 starting at 4 o'clock today. Uh, so definitely check that out. All right. Let's move on to talking about the mechanics of the set. So, Annie, there's there's kind of a, a big picture that seeds through everything in Duskborn here. It's true. So Duskborn is first and foremost a top-down modern horror set. But with each magic set, we always have sort of a mechanical through line that you can see from limited to constructed all over the place. Uh, so like how Strixhaven might be about instances of sorceries or Zendikar is about lands. Here on Duskborn, we are all about enchantments. So as we go through these mechanics, you're going to be seeing how they all coalesce and several of them use enchantments or some of them will key off of your enchantments like this next one. Yeah, so the first mechanic, tell us about Eerie. Anne. So Eerie is a rather simple one. It is reminiscent of Constellation, uh, but it also has this added line at the end. So whenever you play an enchantment or unlock a room, uh, you'll have to hold on for that one. It's coming up. Uh, but yeah, Eerie is just a little trigger that kind of, it's the glue that holds it all together because you're going to be seeing enchantments on all sorts of creatures in card types here. So. Uh, yeah, all sorts of creatures like this adorable fellow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, look at this little guy. He's very cutesy, very demure. He also <laughs> <laughs> has uh, a little eerie ability that mills you as our crabs want to do in Magic the Gathering. <laughs> yeah, I love this is just like a normal, uncommon, and the, the flavor text, every, everything is creepy. And here you see a little bit of the arena gameplay. You see that glitch effect on it. It's very cool when this happens in the game. And we'll, we'll get to the rooms. Uh, how about right now? Okay. Uh, so let's talk, Annie, about the rooms. All right. So rooms were our biggest shot, you know, our flashiest mechanic of the set, you might say. And uh, they are enchantments. And they ask you to unlock things. They mention doors. It'll make sense when you see the actual card uh, in a second here. But yeah, there we go. Let's yeah. do that. Okay, so let's say you want to play Dollmaker's Shop Porcelain Gallery. When you go to cast the card, you pick which side you'd like to have the effect of up front, and then it'll chill on the battlefield as an enchantment. And then later on, whenever you like, you can pay the mana value of the other side to enable whatever that ability is. So it really gives you that flexibility, that feeling of moving place to place. Uh, we really wanted to have two effects uh, on a room because we want to feel like we're expressing like the real massiveness and you know what's behind every door of, of the setting. So. And you see a little bit here about how that's going to work on Arena. You'll see that side is blacked out. It's locked. Um, and then you can unlock it later. And there it goes. And then you get both sides. Um, but I, I do want to pause. The, the art style on this video is uh, really cool, very unique for Magic, and also just creepy as all get up. Uh, tell me about this piece Rules here. Rules where... Um, were my way to play around with a wide shot, you know, that, like something that's immersive, you get to see the house. When we were doing the concept art, I, I said, I want the house to be a character, maybe three million times until it's sunk in, you know? And the artists did a, an amazing job. The rooms normally have two sides. Mechanically, they need two sides. But I, I was like, instead of having frame cut, the room in half. Why, why don't we have art that shows you what's between the walls? This has a little, uh, a bunch of scary monster doll arms and some eyes peeking out. One of the least scary room dividers in the whole set. <laughs> and, <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. There's a ton of rooms. There's a lot of Easter eggs in the art. So I really recommend if you open a room, not during the game, please, but when you take a look at the card, take a look at the art, you'll find a lot of cool stuff in there. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, on Duskmorn, fear is everywhere. It underlines everything. But we've also brought those fears to life, a video. Fears were so fun to work with. I normally don't do concept art myself when I'm working on these sets, but I had to dive in. This came a little late. The idea came a little late in the development. And we dove in to find out with, with Esther Wu, we wanted to see what the shape language of them could be. But it's hard because 
each sphere is different. Like in real life, the cards, each card is different. It, it, it appeals to something else. So we made it a little chimeric, uh, combining different symbols within the same creature, but with the twist that you have the people who were dreaming the fear, anyone who had a nightmare regarding the fear of immobility gets trapped by this. And the faces you see are the people suffering and wailing as they dreamt this. Yeah, and then mechanically, how did we translate that? Right, so when you make an Enchantments Matter set, you kind of have to have a through line of when are we going to be seeing that uh, enchantment type on our creatures. And here, they are you know, on all of our nightmares that are these fear of whatever have you. And, and I want to show one more fear, um, just because of no. the art. This, this is one of my least or favorite arts in the set. It, <laughs> I don't know, a, vid a video, you, you take this. <laughs> so that, 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 that's one of the ones that I uh, personally designed. We, we, had a list of, we had a list of nightmares that people normally have. And uh, I was like, fear of lost teeth, how, how, how am I going to do that? And I was like, okay, you know what, let's do a disembodied jaw. And the teeth are falling out. You can see the nerves connecting and so on. Oriana did a great job with the art and the faces and it coming off like the, like, like the medical chair. It's, pre it's pretty fun art. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty funny. Fun. It's great. It's fun. A little yeah. fun. Well, I can, tell we from the audience, here. I can tell from the audience reaction that they, too, hate going to the dentist. <laughs> right? I, I think that's something that's pretty, pretty universal. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, one of the joys of working on these amazing magic sets is, you know, Avidio and I early on were, you know, we get to look at these concept walls. And so if you can imagine some of the images we've already seen, but then there's so many more and, right, you, you, you have the creepy dolls and just every monster and those elements brought to life, it's, uh, it, it really speaks to how the set really becomes aesthetically such a, such a, a tribute to uh, horror. So, and then here with Fear of Lost Teeth, right, as Annie was talking about, we wanted to have uh, enchantment cards that would come out and matter early on, they're a nightmare, and it just, it does something that's um, great and very functional, and just, it really makes the gameplay um, click. Yeah. So now there is some hope on Dustborn. It's, it's a little, it's a little, uh, and we see it in the form of glimmers. So video, tell us about glimmers. Well, glimmers are, you were talking about the wall, we had a wall of monsters filled with monster art that we made. Part of that was the glimmers, the only hopeful thing in that whole wall. We were talking early in development, there needs to be something that drives people to survive because there's survivors within the house that were from this plane. You're looking at one of them. Um, so glimmers are a manifestation of what you love, what you hope for, what you wish you have, or what you fondly remember. In the previous case, it was a teddy bear. In this case, it's a lamb. So someone had a pet lamb or something, you know? So they show up when you need it to guide you to safety, to guide you to friends, and they're golden. Yeah, and, and mechanically, these resulted in a really cool set of cards here. Yeah, so uh, here is uh, two cards from the cycle of enduring creatures, right? And as you can see, the first time you cast them, you get a, a great creature, you know, in the case of Enduring Innocence, a two-one with lifelinks, and you get um, uh, some card draw. And then the first time uh, Enduring Innocence dies, because it was a creature, uh, it comes back, and um, that's great. It triggers the eerie again when it comes back, and so that's amazing for that. And then you continue to have an enchantment that's um, rewarding you. And then, of course, it's magic. You can find all sorts of ways to refresh it. But um, in the practical case, it's, it's the thing providing hope, and that hope is it returning uh, and providing the light yep. further. That's enough hope. 
Um, <laughs> back to a sense of impending doom. Uh, tell us about our next mechanic impending, Annie. All right, so early on design, we really wanted to make sure we had something to capture the suspense of horror. And so naturally we were like, oh, let's try suspend. Um, well, we didn't end up going with suspend because in enchantment set, you really want those enchantments on the battlefield, right? So Jules Robbins came back one day with this uh, sort of variation on suspend that likewise uses time counters, uh, but when you play a card with impending, it can chill on the battlefield as an enchantment, and then will later wake up as the giant spooky overlord demon. Uh, so we have five of these in the set, and each one of them is a little bit reminiscent of the Titan cycle, like Inferno Titan, Sun Titan, so they have these really powerful enters and attacks triggers. You're going to be getting a ton of value out of these guys as they uh, sit on the battlefield and then wake up into giant dudes. Yeah, and I think we can even see how that looks yeah. on Arena here. Um, it, while we're doing that, a video, there, there's some cool stuff going on in this art, too. Yes, the overlords were kind of interesting to design. That was a cycle where I, the brief to the artist was, just give me something crazy that <laughs> combines our monsters with the mansion itself. So the overlords all have architectural parts on them. And if you see the nice, uh, if you get the catch from between the movement, the Overlord of the Mismores has like a nice pendant. It's, it's a whole gigantic chandelier. So they're pretty big in, they're, they're pretty big within the mansion. As they walk around, they warp all the architecture around them. So maybe you would see them coming, but it would still be too late to run away. All right, next up, we are going to manifest some dread with our next mechanic, Annie. Okay, so... It was a great transition, don't yes. worry. Yes. Um, <laughs> as we know, uh, Old Manifest uh, allows you to put a card onto the battlefield as a face-down 2-2. So the idea with, you know, digging around trying to find a face-down mechanic is, again, it hits at that suspense. It hits at the, like, oh, what was that bump in the night? Oh, maybe, surprise, it wasn't just a 2-2. It was, you know, one of your giant overlords or something. So uh, with Manifest Dread, you actually get this additional selection uh, of your top two cards. You pick your favorite of the two, you put that face down as a creature, and then the other one gets dumped into your graveyard to enable some graveyard synergies also found in the set with Delirium. Uh, and hopefully you can find that creature a bit more often, because while we, I really dig Manifest uh, from Fate Reforge, we just really want to make sure you were hitting those creatures a bit more often to have that more fun moment. Yeah, and we've got three Manifest Dread cards to look at. Uh, Unwanted Remake with maybe the best name in the, this set has a lot of good names, it's but true. Unwanted Remake's up there. Well, yeah, really with Unwanted Remake, right? It's the, uh, it, it really alludes to, it's like, oh, you have your favorite movie franchise and the second one's pretty good and then the third one, and then it's like, oh, it's, <laughs> at some point they become an unwanted, uh, an unwanted remake. Uh, and then from the, the magic card perspective, it's just, you know, uh, this is some really good cheap white removal. Um, one of the things that's, of course, it's always so good to be able to destroy an opponent's creature for just a mana. Uh, but here also, one of the things that's so good you can do with it is you can kill your own creature uh, in response often to it dying and then make a surprise blocker or then even, you know, reveal it if you have a lot of mana available. Um, and so it's nice that it both, it has those two functions of both removing your opponent's creature or making a surprise creature on your own. Yeah. You're also going to see a lot of Manifest Dread in Limited with uncommons like Disturbing Mirth. Yes. So for Disturbing Mirth, um, once again, you can see how we're playing into the, uh, the enchantment theme, right? Um, when it comes into play, you can sacrifice another enchantment or creature and draw some cards. And then if you play perhaps another Disturbing Mirth later on um, and, and sacrifice it, you get to manifest Dread here. So, uh, and, and that's all for just two mana. So it, it really helps you move through, uh, move through your deck, get some creatures. Uh, it really does a lot for Red Black. 
And our final Manifest Dread card is a Mythic Green that can Ooh. Manifest Dread every turn. Yeah, this Hauntwood Shrieker is kind of no joke. Uh, he comes with, he's going to be putting a lot of 2-2 two -two face down bodies all over your battlefield. And his last ability allows you to play with any face down mechanic from Magic's history, basically. So maybe you're cloaking something from uh, the murder set or any other, <laughs> I don't know, just... Find out what kind of shenanigans you can pull with this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, one, and one of the things that was so great about Manifest Dread is, you know, when we when it was part of the set, it just it adds to that dread feeling because yes, you're putting in a two-two, and that could be any creature. You're looking at two cards, so you're just more likely to find a creature. But then also on, on the occasion where you joyously get to put a creature face up into your graveyard, of course, amazing for graveyard and reanimation strategies. But in that moment, your opponent really feels the dread of wondering, what's the, what was the other choice? What's in front of them that's now masquerading as a 2-2? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, we've talked about graveyard synergies and we've seen this mechanic, but um, we're bringing back Delirium, Annie. Yeah, so Delirium uh, kind of fell into place just later in design because we always knew we needed to leverage the graveyard in some way. You know, we have a spooky set. We need to use that spooky zone of the game. So Delirium was a very natural fit uh, considering we had all these enchantments running around, cards with inherently having two types on them. You can also manage to get lands in your graveyard using Manifest Dread so you can dump the land, play your creature, and it was just very useful. That's all. <laughs> Especially on a card oh, like yeah. Demonic Council. Yeah, so here we see, I think this is Marina Vandrell making a little bit of a deal with you-know-who. Um, sadly, she does not have Delirium, so she must search for the demon. Uh, but if you do have Delirium, you can get any card you like. So what's going on here, Ovidio? Yeah, so yeah. what's going on is some awesome art. Uh, this is uh, Babs Webb's debut as a magic artist. So incredible piece. Marina Vandrell is the one who brought about the doom of what is now known as Duskmorn. She, um, she let Valgavoth whisper in her ear that he would take care of the bullies for her. And he used her house to just expand himself all across the plane. And we see this scene where they, they're making the pact here. Uh, I wanted Marina to look defiant and confident as it uh, as it happened. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the house does have some survivors somehow. Uh, so we had to represent that mechanically, which we did with the survival mechanic, Annie. Yeah, so yeah, not everything is about the monsters. We do have a couple people. Uh, we have a little mechanic here, which is kind of cute uh, because uh, it evokes survival in that your creature went through the attack phase manage to end up at, alive at the end of the phase and it's just chilling there tapped. So um, it kind of means you got in a clear attack or maybe it, it was chump blocked or something like that. Or maybe you crewed a vehicle or maybe the wandering rescuer used Convoke on you. Whatever be the case, it meant that you got through combat unscathed. There you are, now you get a little bonus. And we brought back the survivor type to associate the mechanic too. Yeah. So we get a powerful one drop here with the survival mechanic. Uh, I also want to point out, we, we showed the Wanderer earlier, but there's a lot of cool stuff in the set, like Convoke, that lets you do that as well. All right, now let's move on to the Commander decks. We have four this time, helmed by four pretty cool characters. Uh, let's kick things off with Miracle Workers, featuring the return of Aminatu. Yeah, and it's also the return of the Miracle Mechanic. So this Esper deck is all about jamming expensive enchantments, manipulating the top of your library, and being able to cheat them out. So grab your favorite enchantments from Deathsworn or throughout Magic's history, Omniscience, I don't know, whatever. And then just uh, <laughs> blow out your opponents with the powerful Aminato. All right, we also have a second version of Winter leading the Death Toll deck. Yeah, here's Winter again. Uh, it was really fun to get to leverage the characters a second time on the Commander decks to really just drive home what they're about. Uh, so Winter here again leverages Delirium at the front of a Golgari graveyard deck. So you're going to be dumping a bunch of stuff in your graveyard, exiling what I like to call a Delirium's worth of cards from your graveyard in order to uh, reanimate something. All right, next up, 
Uh, of course, we had to have a deck helmed by Valgavoth. Yeah. So this Valgavoth is a little different than the one we saw you before. Again, uh, he heads up a black and red group slug deck. So he's going to be dealing damage to all of your opponents all the time, making them sacrifice stuff. You're going to end up the enemy of the table. But notably, this Valgavoth is a little smaller than the other one. Do you want to speak to that? Well, Valgavoth goes through a process of renewal all the time, of course, he's a moth. So he uh, molts, his husks are all over the basement. And don't imagine a small basement, please, this is a pretty big guy. He gets, <laughs> uh, every time he comes back and he renews himself, he's a little different, a little more horrifying. Um, so this is when he's just molted. Yeah. And, you know, he starts as a 4-4, but by the time your turn comes back around, he'll probably be a 7-7, so he's pretty big. Uh, in our final deck, you two can harness the power of math with oh. uh, Zimone Mystery <laughs> Unraveler. Okay, so Zimone leads up a deck themed to jump scares. So that might mean face down cards with her mechanic Manifest Dread returning from the main set. Uh, other face down mechanics through magic history, as well as just the play style of passing your turn while leaving a bunch of mana up, because honestly, there is nothing scarier than that, in my opinion. <laughs> um, so <laughs> here's the moan. Uh, and you may have noticed at the top of those boxes, it says Arch Enemy cards included. So Arch Enemy, we haven't done that in a while, Annie. What is it's Arch true. Enemy? So Arch Enemy is an alternate multiplayer format of sorts uh, where three of you team up against one Arch Enemy. Uh, the Arch Enemy is teamed with an oversized deck of schemes, which are all free, powerful effects. Uh, and we kind of leaned into that three versus one uh, lineup with the Simone, Winter, and Aminato against the Valgavoth here on the cover. Uh, but any one of the four or any commander deck you want can just be the, the arch enemy when you go to play. So. Yeah, and we've got some art. And th these a video are a really fantastic excuse to do some really cool art. Oh, yeah. I, I love playing with the different aspect ratio. Normally, uh, as an art director, you get to play with just four by three. This time, we got to flip it a little bit. Um, I was thinking about vintage book covers, vintage movie posters when we were directing this. This is a great piece by Jessica Fong of her strength of her comic book covers. I want to bring some of that dynamism into the set. Uh, this is another type of monster that we hadn't seen, by the way, that this is like the unwinds. It's mm -hmm. just like a bunch of um, fabric. And the following one is one of my favorite arts with Valgavoth in it. It's a symbolic representation of him not just taking over Duskmorn, but wanting to take over everything. Because, of course, he feeds off fear. The more fear, the more power. Yeah, and so we've got two of these schemes to show off. Yeah. So here is I am Duskmorn. By the way, these names go really hard. They do. Um, but how do, how do these play out? Yeah, so each of the commander decks is, comes with 10 schemes, and eight of those are brand new with two reprints. Uh, but yeah, again, I do love that we just had more space to play with the art and such. Uh, but here is a new design. It uses the ongoing uh, subtype in order to allow you to kind of stash this scheme for later. And whenever you want to play an expensive spell, you then abandon the scheme and play that spell for free. Uh, and our second scheme to show off is my champion stands supreme. Yeah, uh, we were kind of being able to pair uh, Arch Enemy with Commander allowed us to, you know, mention your Commander for the first time. So we also get to feature Winter here, and it just kind of soups up your Commander into a big scary guy. Yeah. And and it looks to me, Mike, like uh, we haven't done Arch Enemy in a long time, but it looks like we updated the frame. Yeah, that's, that's right. You know, one of the things um, that when we got to come back to Arch Enemy, we wanted to do is, hey, refresh the frame, just give it a, a new uh, amazing look, really bring it into that borderless style that so many people ha have loved and we've been doing with cards. So um, this, this, when you see the, Ar the Arch Enemy cards, they're going to all be in this, uh, this new borderless frame. So it looks awesome and just makes the art look, you know, even more stunning. 
Yeah, and if you've never played Arch Enemy before and you're interested in playing it, uh, there is an article, again, on dailymtg.com by Gavin Verhey that outlines all of the rules for Arch Enemy, which have been updated a little bit for this release, so you'll definitely want to check that out. Uh, now, we're going to get to the shiniest part of our presentation, which is uh, all the, the booster fun and collectability, and I think we're going to start things off with a video. So, it's definitely worth the applause. The Japan Showcase is something we've, we've not done before, and the style is something we've not done before. Tell us what's going on here, Mike. Yeah, so I, I think the video really uh, captures it so well that, you know, we wanted to bring an amazing uh, style from that we all, if you've played uh, Japanese card games or been in the Japanese card shop, it's just, they do such a, an amazing job of pairing these amazing Japanese artists with an all new uh, a, an all new treatment, right? We both have the traditional foil here and the fracture foil. Uh, for those in the room, I do have a fracture foil. If, uh, I'll hop down afterwards and you can come and see it for yourself in person. Uh, and so, you know, we, we wanted to bring that to life and, and, and bring it to magic. The, the collectability aspect is, is so important to us. And one of the things that's amazing about um, the Japan Showcase is, you know, we're introducing it here in Duskmorn, and we'll be doing it ongoing in, in a lot of uh, upcoming Magic sets. And then for uh, these cards themselves, as it noted there in the video, you do get these, uh, they're collector booster exclusive. Um, the, uh, the traditional foil show up at about 9% of collector boosters, and then that fracture foil shows up in 1%. And uh, this slide also shows, uh, if you open a Japanese collector booster, it will always have a Japanese uh, a Japanese language card when you get one, right? But for the English and other collector boosters, the, in those you'll get an English card two thirds of the time you get one, and then the other time we'll have uh, one third will have a Japanese language one. And so once again, that's really, we wanted to bring that feeling of just oh, being in Japan in a card shop and opening up this amazing treatment, this amazing feel, and uh, I, I think these cards really knocked it out of the park. Yeah, and, and before we get to the next treatment, so the, this next card that we're going to put up, which will be the first time we're showing it, uh, uh, someone in the building tried to talk me, I won't say who, tried to talk me out of putting it in this presentation. It's a little disturbing, <laughs> but that's why it's here. Uh, so I said no, and we're putting it in, and so this is the Jolly Balloon Man. Sounds like a, sounds like a good dude. He's definitely jolly. <laughs> so jolly. <laughs> Uh, th that was a great piece by the great Campbell White. Um, the brief was written by Emily Teng, who was the world building lead on the set. Great ideas all around. We had a lot of fun with the craziest stuff we could come up with. Some was left on the cutting room floor. I am super glad that this made it into the card set because I love that piece. Uh, but tell us about this treatment too, aside, aside from him blowing up human heads. Uh, so this is the double exposure treatment. Uh, you'll find this in play boosters and in collector boosters and foil and non. Uh, and then uh, going back to, you know, not only did we want to do modern horror, but we wanted to tap into that vibe of the 80s, right? And, and here with the Jolly Balloon Man and on the legendary creatures of the set, we got to bring this high contrast, you know, color photography looking feel. And so, and it really also sort of highlighted the characters in a new, uh, a new perspective, right? You can see here with Winter and Zimone, it's, it really also, it, it not only captures their external physical uh, appearance, but in, uh, with Winter there, you can see it you can see the psychological uh, horror because that's such a huge part of uh, the, the space as well. And so this treatment really captured that. Uh, and then lastly, we also did these in a textured foil. Um, in, 
not all of them, but there are uh, a, a small selection. Uh, so we have Valgavoth there and also Kaito, another one that uh, I brought for uh, anyone after to check out. Uh, and these are our collector booster exclusive. So, you know, it, it's a treatment that we've brought into some of our master sets and other sets. and. One of the things is as we do collectability, it really lets us pair what's amazing and resonant about the set with treatments that we know it's like, oh, these are going to come together and really uh, do outstanding work. So I'm, I'm glad we brought Textured Foil into Duskmorn as well. Yeah. And we didn't want to leave instants and sorceries out, so we have, Mike, the Paranormal Frame cards. Yeah, so the Paranormal Frame. Um, so here we see... P P here past the veil, uh, <laughs> and it's in a paranormal frame, and, and you also see the regular frame. You know, one of the things when talking with a video, talking with Emily Tang, the creative lead, is how do we bring technology and Duskmorn together, right? Uh, earlier in the video, uh, in the arena, you saw that crab and having that glitch effect. That is something that we felt like really captured the plane, but also we wanted to keep it true to magic. And uh, in, in the booster fun, the paranormal frame was us doing that. You can see here, um, there's that, you know, television, uh, as, uh, it tries to capture the television feel, but also we've done it in um, each frame for the different colors that has a different look and feel as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the spread of the coloring here. You'll even notice a sneaky preview card there in the middle. Uh, split up, that's one of my favorite uh, gags, I guess, in this set. Yeah. They do split up. Yeah, they do <laughs> split up. It doesn't go well. No, I mean, it kind of ties into the survival mechanic earlier about, like, you know, your tap creatures ended up surviving or whatever. Yeah, and, and uh, he, here with the frame, uh, for one, I mean, you have to check out that flavor text on both Split Up and Unwanted Remake, right? But, you know, uh, you can find these in play in Collector Boosters, and so this is, uh, and, and there's a, a nice selection of cards, you mm -hmm. know. So, so we really wanted to say, hey, what cards will work with this treatment? Great, let's, let's bring them in and, and do that. And so I think they came out. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have a really evocative art style, which we're calling the Mirror Monster Cards. Uh, here's a Razorkin Needlehead for the first time, but uh, Ovidio, tell us what's going on with that art style on the right there. Well, a lot of, uh, we watched a lot of horror films, and one of the things that's very common is a, a shot of the viewer getting attacked Normally the eye, of course, but you see the monster in a reflection and really quick. Hopefully the camera cuts to showing you the full monster, but we are trying to mimic that here. We're trying to show when the monster approaches and the horror that is being experienced by being attacked by the monster. So probably how I feel when someone casts that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so uh, here's Hauntwood Shrieker again. And one of the fun things that we, when we were bringing this treatment to life is we really, th there's a number of ways you can s show that mirror aspect, right? Uh, it, in the previous card, we saw it in the glasses. Here, um, you see the, the victim of the Hauntwood Shrieker, the likely victim, I suppose, uh, and you know, hold, holding up their blade to try to keep the monster away, but in the blade itself. Um, and so one of the things I really love about these cards is they have taken that mirror element and brought it to life in a variety of ways. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Mike, I'll stay with you. We are continuing to do special guests and uh, we've got a pretty cool preview card for you here. Yeah, so one of the, uh, one of the amazing things we get to do when we work on uh, sets is we get to uh, work with amazing artists, the videos highlighted some of them, um, getting to work with Masahiro Ito, right, um, of, of, who's the artist for a very popular video game franchise, um, you know, and s taking him and pairing him with Damnation, right, because we only do 10 special guests in each set, and so having Masahiro Ito come and, you know, I mean, Damnation was, uh, when it came out, it was an amazing, right? It's like, oh, it's it's Wrath of God, but in black. And and now in Commander, of course, it's a staple mm -hmm. uh, with, with such a powerful effect. So it's, you know, one of the most 
classic iconic magic cards compared with a, a video game horror artist, uh, that's, that's amazing. And we also saw Collected Company earlier too, yeah. uh, the art for that, so that's another special guest. So, you know, some, some really great, um, really great cards. Yeah, and we've got, I think, the art blown up a little bit bigger here. Such an honor to have him on Magic the Gathering, you know, Masahiro Ito, like someone that we've, a lot of us have grown up admiring his work and he's influenced a lot of what we've done. Yeah, yeah, and I believe there's uh, an interview that's gonna, that we uh, got to do with him as well, and so mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that'll be shared. And as, as part of that, he, he, he shared the, the work in progress. You can see um, what Damnation looked like early on versus, uh, versus the finished piece. So, yeah, yeah an, an honor. Yeah, and our next one's not, uh, it, it, it's, it's booster fun, it's, it's sneaky, but it's, it's a little bit different. It's kind of a, an Easter egg uh, a video. So tell us uh, about the, what's going on in the Lurking Evil cards. So if anyone's been uh, like me in a haunted hotel or a haunted house, you tend to see a shadow of the corner of your eye. Uh, we wanted to kind of replicate the effect of something suddenly showing up and scaring you. And so some of the cards, that's one of the ideas that Emily Tang and I discussed before we even had concept art for this set. We were like, what if we put a monster in some versions of the art and but not in others? And just, you'll find out. You'll find out what the monster <laughs> are. You have, a, you have a full play set and you're like, wait, wait, a, wait a minute, this monster wasn't here. What's happening? So it's a little bit, um, it's our way of haunting the set itself. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then for those of you playing the uh, Mark Rosewater blog -talk game at home, here's the answer to one of your trivia questions. Uh, but no, Norin's here. Yeah, apparently Norin got lost somewhere in the Dominaria temporal time crisis or something like that, <laughs> and then ended up somewhere in Dominaria. But uh, he might be a coward, but he is wary. So I think his chances are good for, you know, getting back to his, his Dominaria, but we'll see. He also has a magic card. So a cool thing about this. <laughs> oh also, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. A cool thing about this treatment with Norin is, of course, if you see the regular version, you're gonna think, oh well, he's just scared of that inoffensive, whatever it is, in between the door. Yeah. It's a gremlin, but on the lurking evil version, you'll see the monster at the top and you're like, oh yeah, I would also run away from that. Yeah, <laughs> he's got good intuition. And, and as Annie said, he does also have a magic card, which we will show. <laughs> um, uh, besides being a, a, a cool card with an, with an interesting ability, Mike, do you wanna point something out for the collectors out there? Yeah, yeah, so for people, uh, so of course, you know, a video and Emily's idea, super exciting. Lo love to bring this in life and play in collector boosters. Uh, three quarters of the time you get a regular version, a quarter you get the lurking evil. Uh, and then for people who don't want to be scared and instead want to organize their collection, uh, you'll notice they have different collector numbers. Uh, so you don't have to be looking at the art to figure out uh, which is which. <laughs> um, all right, our last treatment. Of course, we did this, but uh, you know, with any new frame, it can be a little bit tricky. But we did do borderless room cards here. Uh, yeah, room cards are. Uh, <laughs> My mic was like, yeah, that is. Yeah, that, I was that excited. Is I was really excited. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I'm we, supposed we, to talk. We saw. Okay. We saw this earlier. One of the things that's so amazing about the borderless room cards is, you know, we just. I mean, it, it really makes up what is awesome about Duskmorn, and you're in a in a house of horror. Of course, we wanted to bring the treatment. Um, we we are excited about the frame and that we got to bring it to borderless. And um, I, I think it really, in, in so many ways, speaks for itself. Uh, and these, once again, play boosters and collector boosters mm -hmm. both. I just realized that this mentions non-toy creatures. So, are, yeah, <laughs> keep your eyes peeled for other <laughs> toy creatures, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, now Dusk Morn House of Horror is going to release September 27th everywhere, but that was re it was really close to October. 
So we are doing something special for spooky season. You can actually see it here a little bit. Um, but we have what's called a nightmare bundle that is going to be coming out on October 18th. Um, first of all, it's some of the coolest packaging we've ever done, bar none. Uh, you can kind of see it here. It's lenticular. Uh, you may or may not be able to see that. Um, but then we've got the deck box in there, and there's uh, a ton of cool stuff in here, including a number of uh, promo cards you can get, Mike. Yeah, so um, not only do you get these, uh, the cards themselves as posters, right? So we made, you know, of course, horror and movie poster go together. So they're, they're quite nice sized posters. We also uh, did, you can see there, uh, yeah, so here are the, the in the Nightmare Bundle. Um, we worked with uh, Tim Jacobus, who uh, is, is a, another amazing artist. Uh, if, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the novels that he's illustrated, um, they're wonderful. And so three of the cards that we included as promo cards um, that, that you get, you get one of three of each of these in the Nightmare Booster itself. So you can see Crypt Ghast, Exhum, and, da and Dam were all done by Tim Jacobus uh, in a borderless style. And then we also have Living Death, Goro's Vengeance, and Archon of Cruelty uh, in, the, in the movie poster style. Uh, and so for, for these, you know, once again, the Nightmare Bundle, you get a pack in there, the Nightmare Booster, and you'll get one of the, the first cards and then one from that second set. So. Yeah. And, and here's us showing off the lenticular. Yeah. Uh, How do you packaging. rewind a magic card? Do you know? What's that? How do you rewind a magic card before you return it? <laughs> uh, you put it in the VCR rewinder, oh. of course. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so let's take a look at all the products coming out with Duskmorn. It's a fairly normal slate. We've got that Nightmare Bundle down there in the middle. I will point out, so in the upper right, you're going to see some different packaging art for the Japanese collector boosters. So that's not something we do very often. Uh, they're still collector boosters, just like the other language collector boosters, but uh, Kaito is pretty awesome, and so we put Kaito on the Japanese collector booster packaging. Um, also coming back with Duskmorn House of Horror, our welcome decks. So we've had welcome decks gone for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Applaud. Welcome decks have been gone for a while. They're a great way to bring new players into the game to just teach. Um, a lot of stores give these out for free just to, to demonstrate. So, uh, Mike, can you talk a little bit about what's in a welcome deck? Yeah, so in the welcome deck, um, uh, you get uh, 60 cards, 30 of which will be a deck that is the, the color that you see, right? So if you, if you have the white package, you'll get a 30-card white deck. Um, we've included so, a, a little bit of booster fun in there, but uh, those 30 cards are always the same in every uh, mm -hmm. white deck. And then you also get a 30-card deck that includes one of the other four. So you'll either get the 30-card blue, black, red, or green deck. So basically, in one package, you get um, everything you need to, you know, for you and a friend to start playing, uh, and afterwards, of course, you can shuffle them together, mix them, you know, do, do what you want, but we were, we were excited to bring these back because, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it, we love magic and we want more people to love magic. I so. think I actually got my first welcome deck at PAX, you oh, know? Did you? Yeah, yeah, back nice. in the day. <laughs> nice. Um, we are going to do a bit of a, a rolling rollout. That's going to be the words I use there. Um, that these are not going to be available in Europe, the Middle East, or Africa with Duskmorn House of Horror, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. Um, all right, now let's talk about all the dates to keep in mind for Duskmorn House of Horror. There's a lot coming up. Oh, no, it did the thing. Uh, okay, we're going to read through this. So August 31st, that's today, uh, kicks off day one of 13 days of Duskmorn previews. So not only did we get to kick things off at PAX, which is awesome, but it worked out perfectly to do 13 days, uh, culminating in the full card image gallery on September 13th. Uh, then the Magic the Gathering Arena release is going to be on September 24th. You're just going to have to ignore what the lines look like. Uh, September 20th through 27th, pre-release events at your local game store. So be sure to talk to your local game store. Get signed up early. Uh, it's going to release everywhere on September 27th. There will be some commander parties October 4th through 10th. Uh, again, I'll call out that Nightmare Bundle is releasing October 18th, just in time for Halloween season. Uh, then we're going to have a 
trick or treat Halloween event at your local WPN store, October 25th through 30 through the 31st, followed by an open haunted house uh, just after that and commander parties. Um, I also want to call out we're doing something special for the buy a box this time around. So you will, if, if you look at that card I talked about at the beginning, uh, you will get a twitching doll buy a box promo, whether you buy, <laughs> I see people shaking their heads. Nope, don't want that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you buy either uh, a play booster box or a collector booster box, and as a bonus for Deskmorn, you will also get a collector booster. So that is a collector booster on top of the buy a box for any type of Duskborn House of Horror box you purchase. Yeah, you can applaud for that. That's great. Um, we have thrown so much information at your faces today. Um, ton of creepy art, a uh, ton of behind the scenes information. If there's anything you missed, anything you want to catch up on, head to dailymtg.com. Probably now or in the next, this, says, this timer says zero, so I'm going to say now. Uh, and you're going to be able to find collecting articles, information on WPN events, um, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and more information on this buy a box, which is great. Um, as I also mentioned at the beginning of the show, at 4 o'clock today, we are going to have a special uh, spooky session with Shauna McGuire um, in room 214, uh, author and Tyvar fan extraordinaire. I'll note we didn't preview the Tyvar card in this yeah. I don't know. That was weird. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you may want to stop by room 214 at 4 p.m. today. Uh, it's, a, it's a haunted pop-up, and uh, there may be a few other surprises there as well. So I want to thank you all for joining us, and of course, thank the panelists, and uh, go enjoy Dustborn. Yeah.